what I wanted to do is continue on with the the portion about James the first. <clears throat> Let me share my screen here. So we have the pilgrims who uh, form an underground church uh, in 1605 because of the religious persecution that they're facing. Uh, we have the gunpowder plot uh, in that same year. Um, and this is uh, a little bit off topic for us because I want to kind of uh, sideline the stuff about anti-Catholicism. It'll come up a little bit, but, but there's a lot more to the Catholic connection here within England, the Catholics that live in England and, and Ireland and things like that that I'm cutting out of the story. But, uh, but the gunpowder plot, uh, gun plot is interesting because it is a plot of um, Catholics who are uh, uh, reacting against the Church of England and uh, the, the uh, persecution of Catholics. And, um, and a lot of Catholics are, are powerful people this time. And uh, the gunpowder plot is where uh, there was actually barrels of gunpowder, lar a large quantity of gunpowder stored beneath the chambers of parliament. And uh, the plot is discovered and, and circumvented. But if it had gone off, it would have uh, killed many, many members of parliament and would have been a huge uh, turning point in the history of England. As it was, uh, it turned out okay, but uh, but it is remembered even to this day. There's uh, even a song, Remember, Remember, the 5th of November, um, which is the date on which this was discovered. And um, if you're familiar, uh, Guy Fox is one of the, he was the guy that was actually going to light the fuse. He was, was guarding the gunpowder. Um, and um, uh, if you're familiar with those Guy Fox masks, uh, white masks with the pointy eyebrows uh, that sometimes are worn um, at protests and things like that, more of a thing from like a, a decade ago, but uh, you still see them once in a while. And that's the Guy Fox mask. Uh, it all comes out of this history and um, and there's a, even a celebration, a yearly celebration in England where people go out onto the street and have bonfires. And it's kind of like uh, their version of Halloween. Um, you know, they don't dress up and everything the way that we do, but, uh, but it's a time for just getting out in the street and partying a little bit in public. And um, it's all in remembrance and, uh, of, of this historical event. <clears throat> There is an anti-Catholic reaction, and we have these post popish recusants acts, which um, make the penalties against Catholics and the degree to which they needed to conform a lot more stringent. And so we have an uptick in, in, in the uh, persecution of Catholics uh, along with the Puritans. And uh, right about this time, the Virginia Company is founded. This is another joint stock company showing the growth of the stock exchange and how rooted it is in colonialism. And the main accomplishment of the Virginia Company was to settle Jamestown, which is a city in Virginia. Virginia was a, a territory within North America and, um, and is you know, the state of Virginia now in the United States um, named after the Virgin Queen Elizabeth. So Virginia comes from the Virgin Queen Elizabeth. And Jamestown, of course, is named after James. So that's founded in 1607. And then within 12 years, we have the slave trade uh, uh, taking root in the British colonies, um, which then creates the whole legacy of African American slavery in the United States. And, and as we saw before, African slave trade was already occurring in the Spanish colonies in the Americas. It just extended out to Jamestown once Jamestown became uh, well established <clears throat> and successful. Uh, there had been earlier attempts to settle Jamestown that failed. 
Uh, we have Captain Pouch's Rebellion uh, in 1607. Captain Pouch uh, is his moniker, and he actually carried around a magical pouch that was supposed to protect people from bullets and things like that. Um, and they were occupying enclosed commons. So they would find newly enclosed commons and level, they're called levelers, they would level the hedges uh, that were around these enclosures. The way they would enclose them is they'd plant hedges around them as fences. And the levelers that occupy this would, would cut down the hedges and make it level so that people could easily access it and, and use it for a common purposes like grazing and planting things and whatnot. Uh, the pilgrims immigrate to Leiden, and that rebellion is put down very quickly, doesn't get out of hand or anything. Uh, pilgrims immigrate to uh, Leiden, so these are the pilgrims that end up on Plymouth Rock. Um, they go to Leiden in the Dutch Netherlands, so the Dutch Netherlands now are established as a haven for Protestants. Um, they're they're uh, Protestant states, um, but but this is the era called the Golden Age, uh, the Dutch Golden Age, where it's not only a haven for Protestant refugees, but it's also a place of learning and art. The humanities um, are flourishing here in, in the Netherlands. And um, it's the most liberal and most free and and most uh, forward looking place, obviously well established in terms of wealth. You have tulip mania that's about to take off and things like that. So <clears throat> it's, uh, it's really the heyday uh, of the, the Netherlands, uh, the, the first heyday of the Netherlands, but maybe the historically the, the, the time that uh, is most significant really, because there's a lot going on there. Um, in 1610, James proposes the Great Contract. Uh, and this is a, an attempt to resolve chronic debts uh, uh, from of the crown. And the proposal is to get soakage in exchange for these traditional feudal prerogatives of of the crown, where uh, you have wardship, where the crown could treat nobles as if they were children and dictate to them uh, certain uh, rights and responsibilities and purveyance allowed the, the, the king to you know, change the boundaries of fiefdoms and split things off in the way that, that is you know, at his discretion. Is, uh, and he could impose special taxes and fees in an arbitrary fashion. These were all part of the holdover of feudalism, which worked you know, back in the day, as long as the king didn't abuse them. But, um, but now James is proposing, okay, let's do it. And of course, these things weren't even in use. But he's like, instead of me having these, these rights, which I never exercised because you guys would be all up in arms if I did, you just pay me a yearly fee so that I no longer have these rights. So you, instead of those feudal rights, you give me rent. Uh, but it is rejected by Parliament, probably because he had no real power to enforce those rights uh, well before this. Yeah, so th this is like uh, where we see the diminution of the power of the monarchy. James is selling off numerous baronetcies, uh, just selling off fiefdoms and making people nobles uh, for a fee. And, and of course, were large fees. And so here we see how the class structure as a holdover from feudalism was kind of strange from our perspective. You know, somebody could be the most wealthy person in England, but they still were the lowest stratum of society in terms of power. The only way that they could rise up the social ladder was not by making more money, but by becoming a noble. Uh, but then James accommodates that and he says, well, you can just, you can just buy your way in. How much do you have? Um, but then this is, you know, a real breakdown uh, of the feudal order. This is really not feudalism. 
So we see money taking <clears throat> the place of landed wealth and traditional heritage and things like that. <clears throat> Family relations, social relationships. So if you got enough money, you can buy your way in. Um, and, and this all raises questions of the absolute monarchy. Does the king really have the ability to be arbitrary uh, in any way? You know, the uh, technically on paper, the, the monarch is absolute and can do certain arbitrary things, uh, but, uh, but parliament was starting con to constrain that power quite significantly. And so what James does is resort to this argument of the divine right of kings, that the king is divinely appointed by God and therefore must be worshiped as the divinely appointed by God and must both be obeyed, you know? And so it's kind of like glorifying the king as somehow divinely chosen by God, which sounds a little strange to us and sounds silly, but, um, but it was very effective at this time. It really split the parliament into two different camps. Um, and, and there might be, you know, egotistical reasons for that room among the House of Lords, especially, you know, because they wanted to be kind of worshipped as a, a secondary fashion and whatnot. Um, but, uh, you know, this sort of thing still persists today. We heard it with, uh, nowadays in the United States, it only happens with Republican presidents. The only Republican presidents are chosen by God, but, but Donald Trump, you know, was chosen by God, according to many uh, Christians in the United States. And because he was chosen by God, his policies were ordained by God. They come straight from God. And, and it's the best thing in the world because God chose Donald Trump. Um, and, and so you still hear this thing quite a bit. Um, uh, so it shouldn't sound as strange as it might. Um, and, and then the counter argument to that was the Magna Carta. Look, we have, the, we have this tradition of the Magna Carta going back to 1215. Obviously nobody has ever believed that the the king is inspired by God. The nobles have always been fighting the king since the beginning of time. And, um, and of course, back in the feudal order when everything was working, nobody needed the argument of the divine. Nobody, nobody cared. But now that the king, that the monarch is losing power, now they're trying to hype up some ideological sort of propaganda to aggrandize the monarchy. Um, right about this time is when uh, the Thirty Years' War is going on on the continent. So this is France and the Holy Roman Empire and lots of parties are getting involved. Um, and it's a major uh, conflagration and that will wrap up in 1648 uh, and we'll We'll see the outcome of that a little later on, but that's sort of what's going on outside of England and the rest of Europe. And then in 1620 is when the pilgrims land on Plymouth Rock, okay, and, and found New England in, in North America. So the pilgrims are persecuted in England, they go to the Netherlands, and they ultimately end up in the colonies in North America. As persecuted Christians, persecuted by the Church of England um, for their non-conformity. Remember that Elizabeth was all about just form in public. You can believe ever whatever you want, just conform. In public. And the Puritans are like, no, we can't conform. Like that's that's too far. Okay. Um, all right. So I, I want to cut this off here, and then I'll talk about uh, Charles uh, next.